Hello everyone, welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. I'm your host, as always, James W. Gesso. I'm going to keep this intro pretty short, uh, because the last one, the last episode, had a pretty long intro, and uh, I guess that's my response to it. But I will start it with a thank you for my patrons on Patreon, especially the people whose names are listed on the screen here on YouTube, or are in the description to this episode wherever you have caught the episode. Uh, big thanks to you patrons for helping uh, helping bring this show into existence, not just for yourself, but for everyone who's listening. Uh, pa- my patrons on Patreon enable me to commit full time to this podcast and the larger sort of sphere of my research and writing and speaking in, uh, in psychedelic culture. So yeah, none of us would get to experience it without my patrons so thank you very much if you're not yet a patron and you want to become one or you want to support me in some way or another you can head to jameswgesso.com forward slash support or check out the links that are in the description to this episode wherever you are checking the episode out options include becoming a patron leaving a paypal donation or purchasing one of my books digital or physical or uh, catching some of the cool stuff that is up on the shop at jameswgesso.com. Thank you very much for uh, for doing so. If you are watching this on YouTube, uh, look, there's a giant mess in the corner you can see here. I just moved into this place uh, not that long ago, and I've been in and out of the country, and, well, I'll tidy it up eventually. Those of you who have moved house before, you probably know what it's like to have a bunch of stuff that does not yet have a place, and so it is in a corner. That's what that stuff is. Um, Yeah. Ultimately. All right, into today's episode, we've got R. Coleman on the show. R. Coleman is a pseudonym uh, for our guest. We've got another anonymous episode with an underground psychedelic therapist, not too dissimilar uh, from episode 90, uh, which ended up having a transcript available at jameswgesso.com. Go check it out. Uh, This one is much easier to understand because less modulation uh, to the voice needed to be done in order to anonymize it. Uh, But let me tell you a little bit about R. Coleman, uh, and I'll be reading from the back of his book, Psychedelic Psychotherapy. R. Coleman has been a pioneering underground psychedelic therapist for 30 years, working with the survivors of severe childhood trauma who have been unable to heal using mainstream therapies. Now, this is a part of the book. In this one-of-a-kind book, he imparts knowledge gathered from facilitating more than 3,000 psychedelic therapy sessions. Uh, His book, Psychedelic Psychotherapy, a user-friendly guide to psychedelic drug-assisted psychotherapy, is really excellent. Um, You can see I've got like some tabs here if you're watching this on YouTube. And the underlying underlying game is strong in this book. Huge uh, contributor, I think, to the uh, to the larger body of psychedelic medicine research and therapy, above ground and underground. Some great wealth of insight in there, uh, and so there's some great wealth of insight in this episode. Um, being an anonymous episode, there is no video, although I put some cool pictures on the screen for you to enjoy if you're still watching it on YouTube. But yeah, that's basically it. Uh, the content of the show is going to make itself pretty explanatory as we jump into the interview, and I promised I'd make the intro short. So here we go. This is my interview with R. Coleman on Adventures Through the Mind. Enjoy. I think, uh, yeah, I think we're just about, I think we're good to go. You ready? Yeah. I'm ready. Well, okay. R. Coleman, welcome to Adventures Through the Mind. Thank you. Happy to be here. So let's start off. Um, let's start off with you know I think one of the most important questions to start with, which might be possibly the biggest question I ask you <laughs> throughout the course of the show. Um, that is incredibly. It, it's specifically relevant to the idea of providing psychedelic psychotherapy, which in your book you present as, um, as an effective uh, therapy model for treating trauma. So maybe you can start us by giving a, um, giving us an understanding of what trauma is and how psychedelic therapy heals trauma. Okay. I can do that. Um, Trauma is any event or series of events that are, emotionally, neurologically, physically overwhelming so much so that a person can't handle it or process it in the normal way. So it can be a single event like a rape 
or it can be events that occur over a long period of time, like not having a safe, secure bond with your with loving parents, for instance. And uh, trauma, obvious trauma, would be abusive, like physical, sexual, verbal, psychological abuse. But it can also be um, neglect, abandonment, betrayal. Um, these are uh, not kind of less well-known, but actually more insidious in some ways, and obvious abuse. Does that answer the first part of your question? Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm like, do you, do you make a, I guess this is something that, uh, you know, I'm going to save this question um, it, to see if it is particularly relevant after you ask, ask the next part of your question. Or oh, answer, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so your is how how psychedelic therapy heals trauma exactly um yeah, two basic ways um that don't normally or seldom or with great difficulty happen in in regular talk therapy um the first one is is like the peak experience, which is like um being able to feel comfortable and open talking about shameful or um, difficult subjects openly with the therapist that you've never been able to tell anyone before. Um, and it promotes some um, safety and trust within the therapeutic relationship. So there's an opportunity to correct and heal old relationship and parental, parental wounds. Um, and there's the, um, often the experience of the peace, being present in the moment, having a quiet mind or at least being aware of how much <laughs> how much you're in your head that you weren't aware of before um a feeling of self-love and acceptance um not being self-conscious often being more present in your body and temporarily temporarily there's an absence of neurotic symptoms you may have so so you have a kind of glimpse of the goal, a period of time where you, you, you experience what it'd be like if you didn't have these neurotic symptoms, and sometimes even physical symptoms go away. And for some people, it also can promote an, an experiential connection to spirit that they may not have had, or it may um, just amplify that. So that's so. Those are the peak experience ways that it heals trauma, um, and and then there's the the um, the um, <clears throat> the, the the shadow part of the healing, which is I mean the one the thing that psychedelics are famous for is amplifying the unconscious and making it conscious. So whatever is floating around in your unconscious mind can become conscious so that you can now deal with it. And so in the case of trauma, that includes melting psychological defenses so that you can access painful memories of trauma that you have not been able to access in any other way. Um, and it also, um, it also allows for somatic releasing of the trauma from your body, uh, often in trauma, the, there's all kinds of uh, physical stuff that gets frozen in your body and, and in, in journeys. It's an opportunity for, for that to be released. Uh, and also it unblocks uh, and, and uh, allows access to emotions that you have not been able to get in contact with. That's what I got. Hmm. So <clears throat> when I think about, you know, when I think about trauma, um, you know, a lot of the things that you've met, you met, you mentioned come up there. Um, and, you know, I, I look at it like, uh, from a Gabor Mate type perspective, which is that, you know, trauma is not actually the event. It's, it's the, you know, the maladaptive consequences of, or the, the consequence, consequences that become a type of psychological or behavioral mal, maladaptation, um, because that you right. didn't feel safe to discharge, um, discharge the the emotions that were, you know, coming up as 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 a part of the event. You know, things were too much, too soon, too fast. And that's Peter Levine, um, and you know, because of that, we weren't able to, and because we weren't safe to 
process that, it kind of gets logged in a way. We put up some sort of behavioral, psychological adaptations to protect ourselves from that, but then they never let go. And then they kind of become like a winter coat that was fine when we were in uh, the Arctic, but is terrible now that we're in Mexico. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm thinking specifically, like, this makes sense. Um, why okay so psychedelics they you know they provide a lot of the things that that you said and, and in particular this sort of melting of of the uh, the defenses and allowing uh allowing those unresolved emotions or that unresolved emotional content to come up inside of a, a space you know a safe space with the with the therapist present there the sitter so that they can be you know integrated and, and resolved but i'm curious about um, I'm curious to go a little bit deeper into these uh, developmental traumas, the sort of the more insidious ones that you mentioned. I mean, if if we get into a car accident and then we have trauma afterwards, it's like as difficult as it is to go through that. It's it's easy to point to the car accident and say, you know, that's the event. You know, that's that's the critical event that led to this this um, condition that I have. But it's not so easy, clearly, when we're thinking about you know the entire like the, the, the social, emotional, psychological context of our, you know, parental ecology, you know, as it, as it developed from, you know, pre-gestation into and through into our teenage years and into our adulthood and how that influenced experiences we then had as we were coming into our individuality, it's very hard to place it. So I'm wondering about where psychedelic therapy comes in uh, insofar as discovering and resolving uh, these types of traumas, these these attachment traumas or developmental traumas? Yeah, actually, those, what you're mentioning, those kind of traumas are less obvious, but they're actually, like I said, more insidious, they're actually more difficult to heal because if, if there's been some kind of like a car accident, that's an obvious, you know, or, or somebody's beat you up or raped you, it's like, yeah, that, that was bad, it shouldn't have happened, and I hate the person that did it. And you can get the anger out, and you can feel all that. But when it's, say, parental neglect or insufficient mothering or something like that, what's very, very primal, like to an infant, um, that's harder to heal because it's it's invisible. It's like you, you grow up, and, and you don't know what you're missing mm. because you never got it. So So therefore, like, for instance, in relationships, you maybe get into relationships that are dysfunctional because you 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 don't know what you're looking for really you you really want to be loved but you don't know what that feels like or what that is so mm. you you go after something else in the relationship and then you're not not getting your deepest needs right or met. or you so, go after the the type of relationship that only reiterates the relationship you exactly. had with your parents which is exactly. was not giving you what you needed exactly exactly so with, with the psychedelics, you can actually regress back into infancy and experience the, the lack of, of love and connection and, and mourn that and grieve that and, and sob that out and get angry about it and, um, and um, remember how bad it really was because basically... Very few people have memory earlier than, like, say, let's say five mm. uh, of, of those, and, and especially, like, infancy stuff. Uh, we don't remember what it was like, and the beauty of psychedelics is you can regress right back there into being an infant and being uh, alone, and mommy's not coming, and nobody nobody cares about me, and... Um, and be able to actually uh, feel those emotions. And then also in, within the context of the therapeutic relationship with a, with a loving sitter, there's an opportunity to be reparented, to uh, get some of that unconditional love and being seen and, and heard and taken seriously and, uh, fr from the sitter. Uh, and, and that can be absorbed really deeply, especially with MDMA. Um, and, and so you can like f start to fill that empty hole where there was no love and, and, and 
get an actual experience of what it's like to be, for instance, like tenderly held mm. and, and to melt into the, the, the sitter. I mean, this is all with your permission and everything. Mm. Um, to, to have that experience of actual bonding, symbiosis, with a parent that you never had, and that's profoundly healing for that type of wound, let's say. Mm. Yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking about this too, because, you know, I, I, I believe like, I, I, you know, I deeply believe from personal experience, research, and, and supporting others, and I guess like anecdotal feedback that it seems like, and, you know, connecting in with uh, attachment parenting theory, um, that, you know, we don't really mature into healthy independence unless it's a consequence of being so fulfilled in our childish, our childhood needs that we basically organically blossom into independence. And any deviation from that um, creates complexes in ourselves, which we then later think to be who we are, but they're actually these dysfunctional adaptations to unmet needs or, um, or explicit abuses, uh, and that once we and, and that we will carry those around, and we will forever be emotionally undeveloped in those places, unless in some way or another, be they through a therapeutic process or some sort of you know X factor in our lives, or or you know in a healthy relationship that you know people support us in our in our growth and our and whatever that we never really grow up out of those places. We remain infantile there, and I can see how. Um, you know, in a psychedelic experience, those wounds can open up. We can, and we don't even know why we're acting this way. We don't, like you said, we don't know what we're missing. And in a psychedelic right. experience, these things can open up. And like you said, with the sitter and, and what have you, there can be a moment of getting that thing that we needed as a child um, while, you know, having this sort of transference experience of, of the, you know, the sitter being like a type of parent and then Possibly there's a mystical element which creates secure attachment with like a with with an un, with a with an entity or a beingness that is has you know unconditional positive regard for our soul maybe or also mm. like gaining perspective and compassion for ourselves and it's like well of course I was shitty all these times you know look at how much pain I was in and I didn't know so I I really see that as a uh, as really valuable and I think you're pointing to something here that's really essential, and I wonder if you can comment on it, which is the actual presence of a supportive, um, like a, a, a supportive person, of a sitter. Um, could you comment on that, the importance of that? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's vital for psychological healing, emotional healing, because all of our wounds happen in relationship, <laughs> basically. So our emotional wounds, so it requires a corrective relationship to to heal that, whether it be, and you made a good point, whether it be with an actual sitter or sometimes with a kind of divine presence of some sort or an icon, whatever. <clears throat> um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know, like, we both read each other's books. Um, and one of my, I'd say, the greatest limitations of, of well, you read The True Light of Darkness, but the greatest limitation of the of decomposing the shadow uh, was that I didn't fully understand how important relationships were. Although I had this incredible relationship with the spirit of the mushroom. You know, I, it wasn't until years later that I came to realize that a lot of these things that I felt I was healing weren't really truly actualized until they were brought into my relational life. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and aside from the relational healing, the reparenting, and and so forth, there's also, um, I, I personally have done a lot of solo journeys, like yourself, mm -hmm. and I get a lot out of it. But I also, but when I've done it with a sitter, I get like ten times more out of it because, like I mentioned in the book, we can't see our 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 own face because our eyes are too close to our face. So we have to look into a mirror to see our face. And in the same way, you need a sitter to be able to mirror, to be able to see some of the places where you're, you're not seeing in your own process and your own psyche and be able to kind of gently point them out to you. Because otherwise when you do something by yourself, um, you're not, those places where you're phobic to go or, or you can't see your own neuroses or whatever, they just stay there and, and nothing happens with them. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there is really a lot of value in the amount of, you know, courage and self-regulation and, and um, sort of like wherewithal that is required to journey solo. Um, and also, I, I see, I, I totally resonate with what you're saying there about like the, you know, the real vast, vastly greater potential for, for profound healing um, when we are doing something like this in, um, in a, you know, a, a secure relational dynamic, which would include, say, a, you know, a therapist or a sitter. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering about um, what kind of effects people have from this work. Uh, I mean, we're talking about it, but what I mean is, on average, how many people in, in your experience really end up truly healed of their trauma? Um, how long does it take? And what does that healing even look like outside of the active sessions? You know, it really depends on the person and how 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 deep and how early and how serious the trauma was. Um, but with those people that um, are 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 uh, amenable to this kind of work, and not everybody is, um, pretty much. I mean, pretty much, it can heal chronic depression and anxiety. Um, addictions and impulsive behaviors can melt away um, uh, and just uh, healthier lifestyles develop and uh, um, self-care, healthier relationships, um, dysfunction, dysfunctional patterns and relationships disappear. Um, so it, it really depends. Um, most people um, that are that are good candidates can heal pretty completely from trauma, but there's, you know, there's all these little pockets of ways that um, that you can little things that can, can maybe need continual work. Like a a client may come in and they may may work for a couple of years doing a journey, maybe once a month or something, <clears throat> and for, this is from healing from substantial trauma, and their lives can completely change. And I see that very often. But like even in my own case, I've, I've still got little places from my childhood trauma that <laughs> I still need, still need work. But in general, my my life is like 360 degrees better. Yeah. But there's all you know, there's all these little things. So you know, it depends on on the person. Uh, what I do know is that you you can really expect spectacular results over any kind of traditional talk therapy that's out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think about, um, and I'm not sure where I got this concept that, you know, we don't, we don't need to be great parents, we just need to be good enough parents. Um, Amen. Right. And so and so even when we're reparenting, it's like we don't, and I think it's impossible, and, and not only just impossible, probably not favorable to us to be perfect um, human <laughs> beings, you know, in any way. And, uh, and really, it, it seems to me like the effort is not to become completely healed 100%. I have no issues, which is maybe impossible, probably impossible. Um, but to get to a point where we're, you know, we're good enough in self parenting, self regulation, that we can effectively co regulate with others and have healthy emotional dynamics and, and uh, relational dynamics and, 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 and basically care for ourselves and others in, in a functional way. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I agree. Not everyone can be perfect like you and me. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yes. Yeah, so just don't just don't look under my bed or in my closet. Um, <laughs> so, you know, over the years, uh, you've come to work with multiple different substances as a part of your practice, um, which you outline in your book, and each of them having a different flavor of possibility uh, for the client and also set of responsibilities for the therapist. And I'd like to ask you about each one separately, uh, why and how you use them for people, uh, starting with MDMA. Um, <clears throat> MDMA is something I usually start clients with um, because it's very gentle and it, <clears throat> it um, engenders... Um, trust and openness in the therapeutic relationship. Um, it's good for um, a lot of relational issues, emotional issues. It's, 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 like I said, it's gentle. It, it does. It's famous for um, 
lowering defenses. In therapy, the main thing we use it for uh, is, is lowering, softening defenses so you can um, talk about things that are difficult to talk about or shameful to talk about so that you can access buried memories that were too painful to remember. Um, so it's uh, kind of a general, all-purpose, wonderful, soft, gentle healer, but it does have its limitations. Mm-hmm. And, and so, and so, what what are those? What are those limitations? Um, sometimes it just kind of candy coats things. You can't go deep enough. Sometimes uh, uh, there's a. Sometimes it can be a trap. You can get caught in kind of delusional. Uh, pie in the sky kind of uh, unicorns and butterfly place of we're all love and and it it it's not uh, piercing the, the the veils of of denial and and going deep enough into into trauma because it stays in this kind of floaty warm loving place. Mm-hmm. Like there's like there's a there's a undeniable value of you know for suffering absolutely yeah in order to heal if you've got trauma you've got to actually go back and feel that and release it in order to to heal mm-hmm. what, can you, what you go ahead sorry was that what you meant yes absolutely um and okay. I'd, I'd like to i'd like to get you to explain the expansion contraction phenomenon that uh, is present with mdma well, and it's also present in, in some other medicines, too. Um, under, obviously, under, when you're under the influence, you feel very expansive and um, kind of beyond, sometimes even beyond space and time, and um, in a very loving, open space where you're feeling feelings more intensely than you usually do. You're feeling more connected to everyone. And, and, as, and then when you come down that kind of, there's a contraction and the next day or the next few days, you're back to your old self. Um, and this is a problem when people take it recreationally, they get into this wonderful loving place, but then they come back and, and they're back to their own lives and very little can, sometimes it can change, but sometimes it doesn't really. Some of the deeper things that need to be looked at don't change. So my belief is that um, if you don't, if you're just doing peak work and not going into shadow work, you, you're going to have a tendency to contract back to your own life every time. It's only when you start digging in the shadow where things are going to start changing permanently because now you're, you, you're, you're going into the, the, the deep stuff that has the capacity to transform your, your life when you come down from the drug. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes me think of um, a metaphor I use quite often in my public talks and um, with people in integration coaching about uh, it's a Robert Augustus Masters metaphor about the the tree and sort of look at a, looking at positive, well, to say enjoyable emotions, you know, happiness, joy, pleasure, whatever. They're sort of it's like the branches and the the emotions that we you know otherwise you know, wouldn't really like to feel sadness, grief, hopelessness, helplessness. Um, They're like the root system. And when we're feeling things, we're, you know, we're growing the tree. And when we're, we're growing and experiencing all this joy, this can be incredible to bring in new foliage and, and to sort of help us expand into the world around us. But if we're also not, if we're not also feeling into the, into the dark aspects, into those uncomfortable parts of ourselves, if we stunt that part of our growth, then yeah, we might, you know, we might have a really pretty foliage, but possibly it'll never blossom. And if a storm ever comes, it's highly unlikely that it's going to remain standing in the midst of strong winds. That's a great analogy. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I like the one about whenever they build a tall building, they have to spend a lot of time building the foundation. Because if you don't have a strong foundation, the building's going to keep collapsing on any slight little earthquake or, or whatever. So um, you may build a nice tall building with MDMA, let's say, look nice. But if, if you haven't done the shadow work, 
something, you know, will happen in life and it'll just, the whole thing will collapse because you haven't spent time with your, with your foundation, with your roots, with your childhood, with the, whatever traumas need to be addressed. Mm-hmm. Are there any, um, are there any contraindications to taking MDMA? Yeah, there's a bunch of them. Um, high blood pressure, um, serious heart conditions. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of medical contraindications, a lot of other medicines, SSRIs. Not necessarily dangerous, but it, it just inhibits the whole action of MDMA. Um, a lo- some medicines that just don't mix, so you have to be, more than any other medicines I use, you have to be really kind of careful about um, using that with with people with some medical conditions or taking some prescription drugs and even like over-the-counter cold medicines and some things like that. So it's, it's good to do your research to find out what you need to avoid if you're going to be doing that. Mm. <clears throat> um, this question just came up. I recently, you know, recently, I mean like a couple years ago, had a conversation with Emmanuel Sferos, uh, one of the founders of Dance Safe and um, the person behind the MDMA, the movie. And uh, he spoke about fluoxetine, Prozac, as being um, something that blocks the effects of MDMA and might be able to be used uh, at the end of an MDMA session to prevent the prevent people, the section of people who happen to have um, the unfortunate consequence of a very long duration contraction period, a long duration period of feeling really low, really depressed because the MDMA really likes their brain and it doesn't allow the, the, the gates to close and serotonin levels to rebuild. What is your experience with that? Do you know um, like the safety or the efficacy of using fluoxetine as a way of helping to mitigate some of the negative consequences of MDMA like uh, neurologically? No, that's news to me. Cool. All right. That was a quick question. Uh, <laughs> so, so the next one is, um, this, now this is something that I, I was thinking about because, uh, you know, a friend of mine is, is very interested in, in uh, trying MDMA. Uh, they found somebody to be with um, as like a friend, no really therapists around mm-hmm. out here. But uh, uh, one of the things that they expressed to me they were worried about is that they suffer from chronic constipation. And when uh, when they do end up having bowel movements, oftentimes it could be very distressing because their like blood pressure gets erratic, their nervous system gets erratic. Do you have any experience of constipation being a possible, like chronic constipation being an issue uh, that would present a dangerous scenario to someone wanting to take an MDMA uh, or have an MDMA experience? No, I think just the opposite. I've, I've had quite a few clients, um, including myself, um, that have constipation, chronic constipation bowel issues. And actually, uh, one of the things that heals early on with the MDMA work is that that starts to heal. Mm. Cool. Yeah, good to know. I mean, my immediate, I, I know there's a, pheno- I can't remember what the name of the phenomenon was. It had an excellent term in this uh, book I read a few years ago, Healing with Intactogens. Um, but that, you know, the, there's a psychological softening uh, with MDMA yeah. that directly translates to a physiological softening in muscle tissue as well as soft muscle tissue, um, like, uh, like the bowels. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So let's move on to, uh, to the next, you know, big contender in the psychedelic world, uh, which is LSD. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, LSD is an amazing, uh, it, it, it's a very masculine tool in psychotherapy, um, the, the, the things that I've found it more, most useful for is cutting through denial um, and um, making the unconscious conscious so that, like, if you're having trouble getting to some past trauma and maybe you've been using MDMA and it's not, you're not really getting there, if you start introducing a little bit of LSD, sometimes it can cut right through that um, denial and 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 actually put you right right there in the trauma that's in some childhood trauma, and, and you're right back regressed in, into that age when you were being neglected or abused. <clears throat> um, so it's 
pretty amazing the way it just cuts through stuff like that. The downside is that uh, I'm very careful using it with with clients because it can be almost too stark and uh, too um, just too too stark. It's like there's no softness to it. So you're so it's like if if you're being if you were raped and you were right there and you're being raped and it's it's awful and it's mm. overwhelming again and you can be re-traumatized mm. with too much LSD. Yeah, I definitely always I always felt like um, like LSD didn't really that when when I would use it it would just yeah it, w- it was a very sharp scalpel it just went yeah. right in there and uh, whether I liked it or not we were there. Uh, although yeah. I, I do notice that, at, le- at least in smaller doses, the capacity to sort of conceptually, you know, reorient myself, um, assuming that a, you know, a, a, a significant level of distress wasn't reached, is much stronger with LSD than it has been uh, with some of the other psychedelics that I've experienced. But certainly, yeah, it's a, it's a very sharp, very sharp scalpel. Yeah, but it, it also, by the way, and this is, I don't know if this is relating to what you said, but it is also good for clarity. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So let's let's uh, actually here. Here's a question, and, and this might tie in also to the next one, psilocybin, um, which is you know what are some of the contraindications for people with LSD in particular? I'm thinking about um, people who might have a and and, and I I want to ask you specifically about like the exceptions you have, like people who you will not provide. But is there anything mm-hmm. specific about LSD that you're like, oh, this person, this person should not have LSD or psilocybin, for example, because, you know, they might be able to have cannabis, they might be able to have MDMA, but these two are not okay. Is there something specific about LSD that you'd say, mm, not for this person? Oh, yeah. If, if you know they're sitting on serious trauma, it could be over, it could be, like I said, re-traumatizing too much. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's, 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 I'll try to maybe like quell the questions about who shouldn't because I have a in depth set of questions about that coming up. Let's move on okay. to the next, uh, the next psychedelic psilocybin. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my favorites. <laughs> As <laughs> I think it is yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh, psilocybin just seems to have its own amazing magic consciousness that knows how to heal. Uh, and it's so beyond our rational minds. I don't even know how to explain how it works. But um, psilocybin in in psychotherapy, uh, the way the way I've come to see its best uses are uh, one, it helps release trauma, um, meaning that somehow it allows the body armor to soften so that. Uh, the body can shake and spasm and do whatever it needs to do to to release the the, the trauma. Um, it's also it, it also allows you to access buried memories, but in a in a kind of more feminine, softer way than than LSD with the with the added dimension of like some kind of spirit to it that that gives it a kind of a, a safety and and then also uh it's good for connecting one to their own spirit to their own soul to their own spirit of of the mushrooms like you said or or whatever their own relationship to whatever deity or spirit guides or or whatever there is and that can be enormously uh, useful as as a resource but in general, if like let's say if if I don't know what I need to heal, my ego, sorry, <clears throat> my ego doesn't. Yeah. Think if, if my ego doesn't, if I don't know what to do, um, then I'll I'll take psilocybin because it's sort of like going to God and saying I don't know what I need to do to fix myself, and then just surrender and wait for whatever comes up. And there's always some kind of amazing healing that happens it's that's not in any particular psychotherapeutic um you know framework Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah the 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 deep intelligence of psilocybin um is i mean something that anyone who's explored it in any serious measure um i feel like 
I feel like it should be hard to deny, honestly, because it's it's just so present there. Yeah. So yep. moving on to the next one, and you know, I, I imagine that a lot of people might be surprised by this, maybe not the listeners of this particular show, um, and not myself, but in your book, you actually talk about utilizing cannabis inside of uh, psychedelic therapy sessions, which would suggest um, your opinion possibly of cannabis being a type of psychedelic. Can we talk a little bit about cannabis? Yeah, uh, cannabis, um, it's... It, the thing about cannabis is I found it's not really universal. It's not like it's going to have the same effect on everyone, although that's in some ways true of anything, but more so with cannabis. But um, for people that don't use it recreationally, it can be especially powerful. Uh, it can be like a little mini journey. I had one woman uh, smoke some pot who doesn't normally smoke, and she totally remembered falling off her high chair as an infant and cutting her face, but she still has scars on her face now and, and reliving and, and processing through and releasing that whole trauma just on cannabis. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so, so sometimes I use that alone. Um, I've used it in conjunction with LS, a small dose of LSD to get people into their bodies without accessing trauma. But, being uh, like especially um, indica strains, allowing you to become more more in your body experientially, maybe than you've ever been able to access. And also sometimes um, posture. But the thing is, once you open the doors with the psychedelics, you, um, your use of cannabis starts to shift because now mm-hmm. now you instead of just medicating and and having fun and relaxing, now it kind of opens up some similar places that the the psychedelics have opened the doors of. So let's say um, I I used to smoke in between my my, uh, psychedelic sessions when I was doing that, and I would, um, some of the same issues that I would continue to be processing would come up, and I would be able to, for instance, access uh, emotions, especially that I wasn't able to access without the cannabis. So I would able to be, I would able to, to like sob or do whatever I need to do. And uh, so it was very useful for me in between sessions as well. Mm. Yeah. I, I, you know, I just, I just had a conversation with somebody yesterday, at least not yesterday for the listeners, but um, one of the things that we talked about is here in Canada, legalization is, on like we're we're going like (laughs) we're Mm -hmm. you know the first country you know uh, the UN Mm -hmm. country to you know federally nationally (laughs) legislate recreational use and the question now is you know who is going to be leading the conversation who is going to be you know leading the conversations that will forge the cannabis culture for um for you know, the, for Can- for Canada's you know history to be looked back on later, you know Canada's future, and um, you know if it if it isn't some of us talking openly about like what you've mentioned here, insofar as cannabis being an incredibly powerful medicine for some people, um, and having very you know like having psychedelic type properties that can be utilized in in therapeutic or or even sacred settings, um, then that conversation is going to be led by uh, it's going to be led by big tobacco and big far- and and big alcohol who are you know they're they're buying in to the cannabis recreational uh, recreational market. So I, I appreciate that you're that you're you know sharing this about cannabis and that it's uh, that it's in your book. Well, I'm happy to share it. I'm a big believer in the medicinal uh, properties of it, as as well as just promoting relaxation, because stress is one of the major causes of so many diseases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, stress is... I mean that's a whole other podcast. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about some other combination. You talk about mixing indica strains with LSD to bring people more into their bodies. What are some other combinations that you have worked with throughout the years that you found uh, effective, and for what specifically? Um, I kind of routinely combine MDMA and psilocybin, and also MDMA and, and LSD. Um, 
And MDMA in general is always helpful at the beginning, initially, to dose somebody with a sometimes a full dose, sometimes a half a dose um, of MDMA at the beginning of a session to soften the defenses and open them up, and then like an, an hour later to dose them with psilocybin or LSD, which would uh, then take it into a deeper realm. So uh, I'm especially fond of MDMA and psilocybin combination. Uh, well, no, I've, I've used LSD and... Yeah, the LSD and psilocybin I've used, the LSD, not a huge dose, but enough to cut through the denial and, and get somebody into the trauma. And then an hour later, um, dose them with psilocybin. And mm. the psilocybin allows allows the body to release the trauma, whereas the, the acid not necessarily, they're not necessarily releasing it. They're just in it. So that's a, that's a really good combination that, that I've used. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I, you know, surprisingly, I've never actually, you know, as a as a psychonaut slash person on a journey of healing and psychedelics and as a part of my life as a psychedelic person, you know, I've never actually combined LSD and psilocybin. So um, that's, that's mm-hmm. interesting to consider. Let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, now, let's shift gears, but like go into what this is like, we've talked a lot about the you know, the, the actual sessions, like this is, you know, what we use the substances for, this is what the substance can do, but what do non-medicine sessions look like with people like pre-sessions, post-sessions? Uh, what do those, what is their value to a person's healing process? Well, pre-session talk session is absolutely essential. Uh, You want to meet with somebody for, um, as much time as needed to find out as much as you can about, their history and their issues and build a a relationship and some trust. So that's that's absolutely essential. You don't want to just sit for somebody you don't know because you don't know who you're working with and they don't know you. Um, The after journey, the, uh, the just talk sessions are helpful to the client to help integrate what did happen. Sometimes there's phenomena that happen during the journey that they may not understand or they don't remember. And uh, the sitter can help them point it out to them and maybe even like go through their notes and go through the session and, and point out things that the, that the, that the person that was doing the, the session may have forgotten. Mm-hmm. So it, it's really helpful to help integrate and, and, and bring what was in the journey in Help that, help the client integrate that into their lives and get the most out of it. Mm. Cool. Um, so let's. That that was great. Very very clear, concise, excellent. Ready to move on to this next question. Um, mm-hmm. In in the book, uh, you suggest that most people are fine to do psychedelic therapy, but that there are some rare exceptions. And I want to list those exceptions off by one by one, and uh, get your mm-hmm. reasoning behind each one. Uh, now, the first one is those who have been diagnosed as having a personality disorder. Okay, I'd like to preface this with um, a generalization that there are some people that are so unstable um, and um, so so I'll, just don't have a strong core sense of reality in themselves that um, be, because psychedelics um, lower, soften defenses and allow the unconscious to come up, uh, these people might be, become even more unstable hmm. and, you know, more crazy because, because uh, the psychedelics have lowered the defenses. So that's just a general, general reason why you need to be careful. Mm-hmm. So get, getting back to those with um, personality disorders, this is something, if there's a second edition of, of my book, I, te- I want to add this because I think if you're a sitter, serious sitter, you need to do some research on what are personality disorders and find out what, what, the, what it looks like because get, working with someone with these is, is a kind of a no-win situation and, and it can actually destabilize them and it can be really dangerous and difficult for the, the sitter uh, let's say the most famous one is borderline personality disorder. And 
uh, I've tried working with these people and it really doesn't work because um, they're never able to access the original trauma uh, that happened. So what happens is they displace all their, for instance, rage at whoever abused them onto the sitter mm. or, onto, or onto their boyfriend or their girlfriend or whoever is passing by. And it, it's, you can get into some very difficult situations and, and that they can't really ultimately heal because they can't get to that. That, that trauma is just locked in steel walls and, and they're just not going to be able to get to it, e- even with the psychedelics. Unfortunately, because... These are wonderful souls, and it's very sad. Mm. Now, is this like a life sentence, or is, or, or do you have you seen, say, people who initially are like absolutely not, but whatever it is that they ended up doing in their own life, they've you know brought themselves to be stable enough to have an effective treatment with you? Not with not with psychedelics, but there are uh, cocktails and medicines that, that work with now. There's behavioral therapy that that can help these people. They can have functional lives uh, and some kind of a normalcy, um, but they can never ultimately deeply heal like people that don't have personality disorders. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, I, there's like a little piece there that you said that might, uh, you know, warrant some sort of maybe expansion or maybe just, you know, a pointing at or a showcasing, which is it, it seems like, you know, a lot of people these days they have a magic bullet uh, perspective uh, of psychedelics, especially if they're if they're, <laughs> new, they're new to the scene or they're they're mm-hmm. sort of wrapped up in in some sort of spiritual bypassing. They have this magic bullet sense, um, and not only just like they'll they can heal anyone and anything, or or you know you know they 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 fix you. Or, I don't know. I, maybe I'm mischaracterizing it, but you obviously know what I mean when I said magic bullet. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. But that. Also, they see it as possibly the only effective way that, uh, that, and understandably so, that the stance for psilocybin therapy becomes a bit of a de facto stance against pharmaceuticals. And it seems here that you're making the case that, you know, it's a, it's a context-specific, um, set, there, are, there are context-specific sets of needs, and sometimes those needs are, psilocy- are psychedelics, maybe often. Um, but other times they're the opposite. They're, they are right down mainstream pharma to get a person's life back together. Yeah, it, it depends on the person and how, how, how serious their mental illness is. That, like I, when I first started my practice 30 years ago plus, um, I, I had the same delusion that, wow, this stuff could fix anything. And I've learned the hard way through trial and error that, unfortunately, there are some people that can't be healed with psychedelics. And that was a hard thing to accept. But I learned the hard way. Hmm. So let's 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 continue to move on. I mean, I I try to take whatever opportunity I can to uh, to sort of like because there are probably going to be a lot of people listening to this with the sense of how how can I get fixed? Um, how can I help myself? Mm-hmm. How can I heal? And, you know, mm-hmm. and understandably and with good reason, they're looking for psychedelics and they're going to come into contact with the anti-pharmaceutical agenda of a lot of people inside of a uh, psychedelic culture. And I, I always just try to take every opportunity I can to reduce shame, um, insofar as like reaching towards other forms of pharmacological support to get your life together and get your health back on track. Good. Yeah. So the next caveat or exception that you have here for people is those who have had manic or major depressive episodes significant enough to impair functioning or cause hospitalization. Um, well, this specifically, I think, is, is about bipolar people. Um, through some experience with myself and, and colleagues, uh, doing a psychedelic journey can trigger an, an, a manic episode or a depressive episode. So um, it's a very tricky situation. You don't want to, you don't want to make things worse <laughs> than they were when you started working with the person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, um, I have a, a friend and a colleague of mine, Benjamin Mudge, and uh, he has bipolar disorder, and he uh, is also doing his um, 
his PhD in psychiatry, specifically looking at how certain ayahuasca blends um, would be are you know effective in treating and managing uh, bipolar disorder, and other blends do exactly what you just described. So, just want to drop that name in there for you or for anyone else to sort of watch as that research comes out, because uh, it seems pretty curious to me, and it seems to be he seems to be the only person being like, hey. You know, very, very in very specific context, bipolar people can benefit from psychedelics, <clears throat> although it requires very specific context and very fine-tuned mm. preparation. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm really happy to hear that, because all these things I listed about people who might not be good candidates for this work, these are there are there are exceptions, and maybe somebody else like like this this fellow will find a way. So I, I applaud that. I'm really happy to hear that. Mm. Yeah, me too. He's a he's a great guy, and it's and it's good to see that he uh you know that he found something that really supports him because I don't think I'd know I would know him if he was a dysregulated um, sick person, you know. Right. Right. Uh, so the next one is though, and I mean some of these might seem really obvious to people, but we'll just go through them anyways. Mm-hmm. Uh, people who have had periods of being actively suicidal or who cut themselves or engaged in similar self harming behavior. Yeah, this is not necessary. To me, this is this is uh, more of a caution. You know, I wrote my book for the general public. Uh, not everybody who's a therapist is, is going to be doing this work because my belief is that there are some very naturally qualified people that are born healers that might want to be doing this work. So uh, I included this um, as a caution. Um, I think you just need to be very careful with these people. I have had cutters. And um, I've had um, I've had had clients that were had periods of of being well, definitely suicidal, not so much actively. But you just want to be careful to be gentle. Maybe just work with MDMA for a long period of time, and and not not destabilize these people even more. Mostly, mostly uh, um, the therapy should be supportive and building uh, ego strength and um, self-care and self-esteem without, without right away trying to get to any kind of trauma. In fact, that, that's really applicable for, for most, thera- most psychedelic therapy. You want to start with some positive stuff before you dive into the trauma. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it, it seems like, you know, from what I understand, a lot of the times, you know, uh, you know, cutting behavior and self-harming behavior is is rooted in in um, in this developmental traumas that we talked about earlier that are you know incredibly difficult to open up and and heal if if we're not using some sort of like agent um, in some way or another. And I don't want to I don't want to accidentally fall into that you know psychedelics only kind of camp because there's certainly other modalities but um but obviously we've spoken about how psychedelics can be a a one with a strong potential for positive outcome yeah Mm -hmm. so the next one is those who have schizophrenic or other psychotic disorders yeah that's a kind of a no-brainer um like i said you know the 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 medicines the psychedelics amplify the unconscious and these kind of people already, their lives are already like permeated by their unconscious and they're very ungrounded in reality. So you don't want to give them medicine that's going to um, break through defense, what little defenses they have and risk them becoming more unstable and less functional. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. So the next one is uh, those with severely impaired impulse control. Yeah, this is, um, these are, um, let's say, someone who is able, unable to control risky, impulsive acting out. Um, for example, can't be around sexually desirable, desirable people without violating sexual boundaries. Or someone who's going to like the drugs and then outside of the therapy start using them abusively. Uh, or like uh, criminals with little impulse control who will steal anything or, uh, you know, assault people. Um, these people generally already don't have a strong and stable enough core to do uh, the medicine work. Mm-hmm. 
So this is a generalization. There are also, you know, there, there are also some rare, some rare exceptions to these, by the way. Mm -hmm. Any that particularly stand out in this moment? Um, uh, not that, oh, I can't remember. Not, uh, not that's coming to mind. Okay, well, um, let's well let's move into the to the next one then the last one, which you know when I when I read it you know because of my own sort of history of interests over the years um, as someone who grew up in a fairly fundamentally Christian home uh, you know during my you know adolescent rebellion I definitely entertained the exact opposite of everything I was told, um, so it, <laughs> so it made perfect sense to me, but it also I mean it seems sort of like kind of oddly placed because there's nothing else in your entire book that would even reference you thinking about this kind of a thing as being relevant, um, which is that survivors of satanic ritual abuse. Mm -hmm. And do you want me to comment about this? I do, yeah. Well, oh, okay. Um, I've actually tried with a couple of these people uh, un unsuccessfully. First of all, the, the trauma is just so incredibly, unbelievably horrendous <clears throat> that um, it's almost impossible to access and, and, um, and heal it. But the second thing that I found is that some, when it's very, um, very ritualized and very organized, they actually program the, the kids that they're, that they're, that they're abusing so that therapy doesn't work. So like when I was working with uh, my, this one client, we would do a session and he'd have memories of the, the trauma and he'd start to integrate them. And then the, the next time I see him, they completely vanished. And um, so some of, some of this satanic network is very highly organized and they have very sophisticated ways of programming it so that therapy will never work. Unfortunately, it's really, really sad and horrendous what goes on in those places. I, I think that's really like the big surprise for me was, you know, or maybe the surprise for a lot of people is, you know, it, is this frequent enough to warrant um, bringing it up that, you know, like, oh, by the way, you know, this specific thing, um, you know, watch out for this. Like, ha have you noticed it being like, is, is satanic ritual abuse like a common common enough phenomenon to to warrant it as a as a as a boundary for or as an exception for people who should do to psychedelics i think it's well it's certainly not super common no but for uh, somebody who would run across it a therapist or a sitter who when the client starts remembering this stuff uh, it was important enough for me to put in there that um this is you know, don't expect that you can actually heal this person and be very careful. Uh, so unfortunately, it's it's way more common than is commonly aware of. Um, I've done a lot of research on it when I was dealing with these clients, and it's 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 scary how entrenched it is in our political uh, police system, um, in the media, and the they've got people in control of a, a lot of this culture and the trauma is, is such that very few of the, of the um, victims ever really make it to therapy, although they, they do have support groups for them and, and there are therapists who specialize in that. So it, to answer your question, it's not super common, but unfortunately it's probably more common than any of us would like to, to know about. Mm, yeah, I definitely, yeah, I mean, I had my I had my days being absorbed into some of the theories around um, around you know Luciferianism and satanic ritual you know manipulation of people so as to control political and systemic issues or systemic um, the systems in general uh, and and I think I had gotten to a point where I wanted to basically tell myself like okay maybe but also probably not so I feel like a little sense of like whew. Okay, might be time to revisit that stuff if uh, if it's noticeable enough that someone like yourself has had you know firsthand um, firsthand immersion in, in the in the in the in the actual impact of that and the presence of it in people. 
Exactly. I wouldn't have believed, it's so unbelievable. I wouldn't have believed the stuff myself if it wasn't right in front of my eyes. They were reenacting it coming out of their psyche. Mm -hmm. And this is a curiosity, and, and we don't have to go here, of course, by any means. And I hope that the fact that I'm going to ask you this question doesn't, you know, like, doesn't, it isn't a hang up for other people. But do you believe that there's some sort of, that the, the, the satanic ritual abuse specifically is because of some sort of external agency that is present with satanic rituals. Um, and what I'm referring to here is like forces of good and evil entities. Is that what's, is that sort of like behind what you think is behind this issues with satanic stuff? Or is that just the cultural form that a very highly organized um, system of ritual abuse has taken um, in the modern world, which has, and in the Western world, which has, you know, deep, long-running history with Christianity. I'm not really clear on that. You mean, are there actually demonic forces, or are we talking yeah, about you know are there actually physically groups of people that are organized? Well, um, I, I think, thank you for asking, because, like, but the question just came up now, so it wasn't very clear. I was almost like, I was asking myself out loud. Uh, but, yeah, demonic forces, do you... Do you believe in that? I mean, believe is weird. I feel like I'm not really representing myself great right now as an interviewer <laughs> or, you know, or even as an intellectual person that is curious, mm -hmm. but I am, I am, you know, interested mm -hmm. in what your thoughts are insofar as demonic forces. And could that be part of what's going on with the satanic ritual abuse? Yeah, there are demonic forces. I don't know how, I don't want to make people paranoid and get into these, these kind of, I don't know, weird, weird places. Um, ultimately, it's really, really the absence of love and the absence of God. Um, I, I, I don't really, I mean, it's, I don't know, I'm not, I, I can't give a clear answer from that, and I'm, I'm afraid, you know, listeners can spin off into into some really paranoid places with, with this stuff. Because my experience is as long as you're living in your integrity, out of, out of your heart, your connection with spirit, you're safe from demonic presences and their influence. Hmm. Well, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you out of the hot seat here on this one because um, I, I, you know, I have, I have recently been finding myself, you know, I, I remain, I remain thoroughly skeptical, um, you know, healthy, healthy skepticism, which of course requires an open mind. Uh, mm -hmm. and I'm also getting a lot more people saying like, we want to know about this and people coming out of the woodwork saying, James, this is an area of the culture that you're failing to, you know, to properly represent. And it's an important one. And I agree. So there are going to be some episodes coming out. I'm, I've got a few interviews lined up, um, from this one to explore that topic specifically. So for the listeners who feel like you just got teased, I promise there's stuff coming up in the pipeline. Uh, let's let's move on a little bit here, um, kind of like maybe rounding it out. Um, there's a your book is is really like helping people as like a primer to you know this is what it's like to provide psychedelic therapy to be a therapist to be someone receiving it. Here's the you know the ins and the outs and the caution like you know a great introductory like guide, simple, concise, effective, feels very complete. Um, and we've talked a lot here about, you know, as a, you know, sort of conceptually, theoretically, this is what the psychedelics do, you know, therapeutically. And here's some, you know, as a therapist, here's some things you should avoid or as a person experiencing them or possibly experiencing them. Here are some, you know, like conditions that should, you know, maybe put caution, but, is if there was like a, one piece of advice um, that you would offer to people who are listening, who are about to, are currently, or will in the future be asked to be somebody's psychedelic sitter, is there one piece of advice that you would offer them to say <clears throat> like, definitely keep this in mind besides reading your book which is i think an, an obviously positive suggestion is is there some piece of advice that you feel is golden for the listeners just one 
You can pick a couple, oh, but, but like what what yeah. what comes up as being really salient for you in this question? Just be present with with the person you're you're sitting for. Be open. Be present. Let go of your own agendas, um, and just um, surrender and and be open to to what needs to come up from that person on that day and um, try to trust your intuition. I know that, I mean, there's a lot, you really should, you need uh, a lot of information to be a good sitter, which is exactly why I wrote the book, uh, to help people that want to be sitters or people that are are already sitting and need, need some better advice. So I, 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 it's hard to think of one thing. I guess that would be it. All right, that's good. I mean, like it's kind of an unfair question, and and I was I was I was prepared for an answer, uh, you know, some, something similar to what you just what you just gave there. So I appreciate that. Um, R. Coleman, let's let's round this out completely. And why don't you give us uh, give us the listeners um, the the details as to how we can read your book? Well, my book, Psychedelic Psychotherapy: A User Friendly Guide to What Is It. Um, Healing trauma with psychedelics. I forget even the time. <laughs> uh, hold on, I got the book right next to me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it is psychedelic psychotherapy: a user-friendly guide to psychedelic drug-assisted psychotherapy. That's it. Yeah, buy my book. Is there? Um, is yeah. it's on Amazon or? It's on, yeah, it's on Amazon. Yes. All right. Well, uh, for the listeners, I'll be sure, as you know, uh, that a link to buy that book will be present in the show notes to this episode at jameswgesso.com. R. Coleman, thank, thank you. you so much for being on the show and uh, for offering us your time, and uh, and for writing this uh, writing this excellent book. I, I you know, I, I I really can't thank you enough. I feel like it has just landed in such a great way for me. Um, so I assume that the same is uh, the same is the case for a lot of others now and in the in the near future. Oh, it warms my heart to hear that. I'm glad it's helpful. Thank you so much, and thank you for providing this opportunity and doing the work that you're doing for the cause, getting the message out to whoever can hear it. Great. Well, and cut. So that is uh, that's the interview. Glad to listen. Glad you listened to it, and I hope that you like it. And if you did, if you found there was value in it for yourself, or possibly there might be value in it for others, uh, please do a. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't script these intros or outros. I just kind of go for it. So sometimes my brain just goes all poo brain <laughs> out of nowhere. Um, so what was I saying? Yes. Uh, share it with a friend. Additionally, if you would like to support the show financially, I would very much appreciate that. And you can do that um, through PayPal by heading to one of the links in the description or heading to jameswgesso.com forward slash support. You could also become my patron on Patreon, which I would really appreciate. Um, and if you get involved on Patreon um, at the $8 plus level, you get included in a Dropbox folder that has a bunch of exclusive stuff for you, stuff that other people would need to pay for, and also stuff that is entirely unreleased and will likely continue to be unreleased um, content from my work um, is the thing. Um, yeah, wow, well, I'm fading, I'm fading, but we got it. Here we go. Um, finally, if you did like the interview and you would like to support R. Coleman and slash, you know, support yourself uh, in learning more, I highly recommend his book, Psychedelic Psychotherapy. Uh, links to get it will be contained at the show notes of this episode at jameswgesso.com. And that's it. Thank you. Um, really appreciate you tuning in and listening all the way to the end. Now you can enjoy the soft, smooth sounds of the tin box as we close out the episode. Okay, see you on the next one.